All right, well, we are really excited to introduce right now our fireside chat with Paul Tran, the CEO of Manscaped, moderated by Josh Barron, the Chief Brand Officer at Pattern. So welcome, Josh and Paul, to the stage. They're going to run the video? Trim it, baby. Meet the new face, among other parts, of Manscaped. I got a hot date. You gotta try Manscaped. Manscaped.com. Grazie, Manscaped. Manscaped. Hat man. So the screw can't see it. Manscaped. Manscaped. The hump on it. Manscaped. Who could you remember? Manscaped. It's fantastic. Manscaped is phenomenal. I mean, I grab bar. I'm a sick fresh. You gotta try Manscaped. Manscaped. Put it in. Pull you up, Mira. Manscaped defines my generation. Uh, so welcome everybody. Obviously we're thrilled to have Paul on stage today. Um, I think if you think about this conference, Accelerate, right? The growth that, that Paul and his brand have experienced over the last few years um, is something I think we're all envious of. Um, so we've got Paul on the stage today to help us walk through kind of his journey, some of the challenges he's faced, some of the opportunities he was, he was in place to seize, um, and how he's moved that brand, um, and some of the key elements, both strategic and philosophical, that he's deployed um, to help that brand grow. So uh, thanks, to Paul, for being here. Thank you, um, Josh. Maybe we'll jump right in. Um, how about telling us about Manscaped, how it started, and, and get us into your journey? Yeah, I'll, I'll start by, by going back a little further. Um, I've always been an entrepreneur, so um, it, you know, Manscaped was probably my, what, my tenth company, you know, and, and it, it, it takes that many tries to really know what you're doing and, and, and get to scale. Um, but the story behind Manscaped was we, 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 we recognized there was a white space. We, Actually, we hypothesized that there was a white space, that men were grooming themselves, but weren't talking about it. They were too shy to talk about it. Um, and when you think about white spaces in, in hygiene and consumer, it's really rare. Um, but we, we, we hypothesized that there is white space in this, in this uh, hygiene behavior, and we, we went to go prove it out. And I, I think I, everyone here, I, I, I'm imagining you guys are all entrepreneurs and you know, Amazon sellers. Um, and it's, it's, for us, it was all about testing, making sure that there was a, a market and that we can deliver a product market fit. So we started out with our lawnmower 1.0. Uh, we created the device, we brought 10,000 units in, and we sold out within a week. And then we sat dead for probably two, three months as we ordered more inventory. But that was, that was how the first year was like, was just really um, figuring out uh, how to speak to men, how to, um, how, to, how to reach them, and how to break down that barrier. That was, that was the biggest thing, was the conversation around this taboo topic at the time. But right now, because of the hundreds of millions of dollars that we, that we spend on marketing, uh, breaking down this taboo, 
uh, it's, it's been normalized. It's not that hard to talk about manscaping anymore. Um, but you have to remember that was about half a billion dollars ago uh, that, that, we're, we're, that, that we've now um, conditioned and, and told men that it's okay to talk about hygiene. It's okay to, um, you know, to take care of yourself. So, you know, we saw that white space, we took it. Fast forward to today, we, um, you know, we Manscaped represents that entire category. So we created a category and named ourselves after it. Um, and so uh, we operate in now 39 countries. We've scaled massively. Um, uh, so if I would leave anything, I would say, you know, have a, if you have an idea, test it and go after it. Um, because you, know, you, you never know where, where it can go. Awesome. I think part of the challenge that, that I'd love to hear about is how did you go about building a brand that you could stand behind and maintain that standard while scaling your business? So I think there's a lot of corners that can be cut. And there's a lot of decisions that get to be tough. And it's a lot of revenue versus what do we really want our business to be? How did you manage that through the, through the life cycle? Yeah, this is a really interesting question um, because you know, if, if your focus is just to make money, that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's really hard to build a brand with, uh, with soul, right? with, with an essence, if, if you're just out to, to make money. Um, the, the way that I would answer that question is, if you want to build an enduring brand, you gotta believe in it. Right? You gotta make it your passion and your mission. And through that, your excitement um, and your belief, you'll foster people around you. you know, you'll, you'll start hiring people that have the same belief. And then with that, you'll start uh, to create a community around you. Now, I'll, I'll give you a, a good example. When we were just first starting out. We saw that we had diehard fans. There weren't that many. There were 10, 20. So we, we wanted to foster that. So we created a, a Facebook group that, that these guys, um, you know, we, asked them to, we asked them to join. We didn't make it easy. We made it actually pretty difficult for you to join because we wanted to make sure that the people that are going in to this group uh, we called it Manscaped Ballers. And uh, <laughs> um, they had to actually fill out an application to, to, to get into this Facebook group. But when they're in there, they're, you know, they, they get access to us, uh, to, to the management team, to the product team, and, um, and to, to other, other ballers. Um, and fast forward to today, we're, that group has grown to 20,000. And I mean, we have millions of customers, but we have 20,000 um, just die-hard Manscaped ballers that uh, when, when we, whenever we need people to test products, whenever we need someone to um, review, you know, take a poll, how, like, they, they're always there and they're always, um, they're always ready to help. So that was, uh, that was a big signal for us. And then what, what, what really gave me goosebumps was I saw that these, um, these face, these, Ballers, um, they were uploading videos of themselves getting Manscaped tattoos on, on their body. And that was like, oh my gosh, that, that just gave me goosebumps. So if you guys ever walk around and see Manscaped tattoos on, on people, they're, they're probably a Manscaped baller. <laughs> so it sounds like you're marketing and branding people having a good time with this. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think segueing into kind of the business and how you've grown it, you started off as a D2C brand where I think a lot of what you just talked about is super important from building a brand, but then you had to transition into other marketplaces and other channels. How did you, how'd you think about that transition? How, what's the experience been like? Yeah, I think that we were, I, I, looking back, I think that we were ahead of our time. Um, and remember we started about five years ago, so we're, we're, not, we're not that old, um, but back then, you know, D to C, the term digitally native, um, was all the rage. Everyone wanted to be D to C. But we made this stance that we're, we, we, we don't want to just be D to C. We want to be omni-channel. And we want to be where our customers are at, at, at any given time. So we, we kind of flipped that playbook. And I think, I think what, you're, what you're seeing now is it's really important. So I would encourage everyone here to consider looking at their business and how to transform it to be an omni-channel brand instead of just an, an, a, a single-channel brand. Uh, and the reason that that, you, you know, that that hypothesis really played out, and we were fortunate to take that stance early on, was we saw tremendous growth through, through COVID. And, um, and that was primarily on, on the D2C channel. Retail was, you know, retail was dead. 
um, we saw a tremendous growth on our, on, our, uh, on our marketplace business. And that's you know, Amazon here in the States. Um, but that, that was, it, it was really important that we were in those channels to be able to capture that momentum. And now after COVID, what we're seeing is a return to retail. retail. And once again, because we're an omni-channel, um, we're, we're able to capitalize on, on, that, on that opportunity. So I think we're gonna continue to see a shift in consumer behavior, because you, you don't really know where, con the consu consumer is really finicky. So you don't really know where they're going to, uh, wh where they're gonna shift next. So being, being make, making sure that you're there when they do make that shift, I think is really important. Yeah, absolutely key. I think a lot of folks in this room understand that omni-channel journey and, and some of the challenges. Because you started D2C and then moved into some of these other channels, are there pros and cons? that you experienced between D2C and, and starting business that way and then moving into these other channels? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, a, 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 a relatively positive one. Um, if you think about there are, you know, I, I wanna break it down to three, the three channels. Right? There's, there's D2C, uh, marketplace and retail. So if you, look at, if you look at D2C, that's the most valuable channel because those are your customers. You get those people's emails. You get to communicate directly with them. You get the power of storytelling. And I can't emphasize how important that is. Right? Every time you sell a product to someone, regardless of the channel, the story that you're telling them is, is incredibly crucial. Because that's how you build a brand. If it's just for pure utility, um, there's nothing valuable there. They can go buy from anybody else. But that storytelling is what attracts them and keeps them loyal. But there's, there's, a, there's a reason why Louis Vuitton sells a $3,000 purse where you could serve the same utility with a Target plastic bag, right? So that, that to build a brand, an enduring brand, you have to execute storytelling really well. And so the most valuable channel is D to C. And then after that, right after that is Marketplace. Because mar Marketplace gives you the, the, still the ability to tell your story Whereas you, were, the, the, the con is that you don't have, those are not really your customers. So you have to work a little harder to tell your story. And then retail, of course, it, you know, these are the retailer's customers. They walk in and out of those aisles. And so now you're, the only way that you can tell that story is on your packaging. So when you, dis, when you distill that down and choose where you want to focus your energy, um, your D2C is the, is the best way to tell your story. Retail is is not as is not as easy. Um, you lose a little bit of control with marketplace, and you lose a little bit more control of retail. Um, but I would encourage everyone to really think about how you how you tell your story to your customers. Yeah, and I think the the channel specific approach is really important. And you mentioned kind of the changing retail landscape. Um, I think with COVID, and we all kind of had different experiences with that, depending on the categories and channels you played in. Um, how does your business look and how did you have to pivot the business and has that pivoted back since, you know, kind of the end of COVID and can you walk us through that progression a little bit? Because I think, you know, we certainly at Pattern experienced some of those highs and lows of that and I'm sure everybody in the room has seen the same thing. Walk us through a little bit about how your world changed and how you thought about managing the business and how you leveraged the channels maybe differently pre, post and during. Yeah, um, so we would, we would think about pre-COVID as, um, as the baseline. And, and through COVID was an ex a, a period of accelerated growth, mainly because the consumer, um, the consumer landscape kind of changed. Everyone was home, they're focused more on D2C. You know, you saw amazing growth on Amazon that is, that is carrying through to today. Um, and, then, and then post COVID, now it's returned to, f to figuring out where consumers' mindsets are gonna be. Where, 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 where does discretionary spending, where, where they're gonna spend. Um, and if you're, if you're a, I would say, I'll, I'll answer this question in, in, in multiple stages. If you're, if you're a smaller brand, it's not, as, it's not as important. Macroeconomics is still important, but not as important. You're really more focused on, you know, I'm doing a million a year, how do I get to five, right? Or if I'm doing five million, how do I get to 15? If you're a, much, uh, if you're a larger brand, that kind of growth is, is really directly tied to consumer behavior, consumer sentiment, how a lot of people care. Um, but, um, you know, if, if you think about, you know, before, after, and uh, before, during, and after, I would encourage you to think about it that way. Bef before was kind of the baseline. That's how the world was. Um, COVID threw everything in, 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 into a flux. And then and right now we're returning back to what, what the world could be at a more sustainable rate. 
Yeah, I think you, you've obviously been successful. You know, the growth rate's incredible, and, and you guys have been able to manage that and move the business accordingly. I guess if there's one thing that stood out to you or, or stood out to us is th that growth, right? And I think one of the challenges that, that would naturally come about is how do you maintain a consistent customer experience and make sure that your brand is delivering the customer promise that you're making? I think whatever you make as a priority for your company, it will, it will be a priority. Right, so if you're, if you're the, in, in the management team, you're the founder, whatever you make as a priority, whatever you set as a priority, it will, it will exude, it will, it will flow through to everybody else. So if you make customer experience a priority, that will, that will resonate throughout the business and throughout, throughout your, your customers. And if you make you know, pr product quality a high priority, that will, that will exude and that will, that will resonate. So I, I encourage you to really think about what are those three things that make you exceptional? Like, what, like if you're looking at, I don't know, you're making a widget and you're selling it on marketplaces, and that's how you start out, very similar to us, right? Um, what, what are those three things that's gonna, be, that's gonna make you extremely different from everybody else? Is it the customer service? Is, is that the customer experience? Is it product quality? Is it design? What, is, what are those three things uh, that, that make you really different, and then really focus on those three things. And, and, and if you do that, if you just focus on those three things, um, you'll start defining what you stand for in the marketplace. And when you start defining what you stand for, it'll automatically roll to your customers. Your customers will be able to see it and feel it. For us, consumer experience uh, was incredibly crucial. As soon as you open your box, we have little things like when you open your box, the first message that you read is, um, your balls will thank you. <laughs> and instantly, you start to feel um, what we call humor with a purpose. Because we also work with the Testicular Cancer Society, um, and, and you start to feel that there is a humor here, and that humor breaks down the barrier, right? That, because there, it was a taboo uh, topic that nobody wanted to talk about. So that humor breaks down the barrier, and then you're presented with a really amazing design and really high quality products. Because we didn't, want, we didn't ever want to be the cheapest player. There's a lot of, there's a lot of trimmers out there. Um, we wanted to be the best, and the best often comes with a premium. So our, 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 our products cost a, you know, a good 25% more than our competitors, but we wanted to make, we wanted to make the best. Uh, and that's what, what, that's, what we, that's what we stand for. So that's, that's, what, that's how we kept, that's how we, that's how we were able to be consistent, um, just not domestically, but also internationally. Yeah, that's, that's actually a great segue. I think, you know, international is a challenge for a lot of folks in this room. I think that, you know, part of Pattern's world is international and helping brands do that. And I think, you know, we're all familiar with some of those challenges. Talk us through that experience. I think as you're growing, you know, having so much su success domestically, adding a bit of chaos when it comes to international growth and some of the challenges there, you know, could have been easy to sit back and say, you know what, let's ride the wave of domestic growth, let's do that. But you chose to go international and expand the business that way. Talk us through that and some of those challenges. Yeah, for us, um, you know, international was something that was very important to us because, you know, we, we set goals and I'm sure everyone's goals here is, is different. You know, some, you know, there was a time in my life where a $10 million exit was gonna be, it's life changing, it's phenomenal. When we embarked on, on, on Manscaped, we, want, we knew we wanted to build a multi-generational brand. We wanted to build an enduring brand. And to do that, you, it, 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 we realized it was a land grab. And we, we, we wanted to own this brand internationally throughout the world. So we filed international trademarks um, and expanded internationally very quickly. And um, it, it, was, it, it's, it, it, was, it was challenging because we grew from one to 39 countries in less than like 18 months. And to do that, you, you have to have a really good and solid foundation before you can expand internationally. Um, but we, we definitely underestimated the amount of work that that, that requires. Um, and you know, being, being the entrepreneur, you're, you're, you have to be the one that's always on the gas, right? And you, and you surround your people, uh, you surround yourself with people that um, that help you execute that vision. Uh, but we definitely underestimated the amount of work because like internationalization, um, you know, just getting product uh, through regulatory uh, and in, in all those countries, it was, 
it was all, it was very challenging. Um, but now with, with companies like Pattern, um, you know, marketplaces, it makes it much easier if, if you're not going D to C first. And in some of those countries, we didn't go D to C first, we went through marketplaces first to test. So as you're looking at how do I you know, expand internationally, marketplaces is a pretty easy way to expand internationally um, and, and test if there, if there is a market. And, and I use that word test so, like, so often because it's really important to test, test, test all the time. Because just because what's winning here in the US doesn't mean it's gonna be a winner internationally. Like the things that you say, the words that you use, it's a different sense of humor in Germany. It's much darker and uh, sarcastic. Uh, and the French is totally different also. Um, so I say test, 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 and use marketplaces to do, to do that. Well, you, you, you hit the question I was gonna have, is I think if you, if you use humor with a purpose as kind of a baseline for your go-to-market, markets definitely are gonna play different to that. Did you, was there a ton of pivoting there? Was it research, was it gut? How did you guys kind of manage that as you moved into different markets? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I would say start, always start with, um, with English-speaking countries. Because I, I, think, I think most people here are, are starting with, you know, in the, in the US, right? So Canada, Australia, UK, New Zealand, those are your, I, I, wanna, I wanna make sure I give like really focused and sound advice so there's actually, you can take away something. As, I've been in a lot, I've been in the audience for many speeches, you know, of these and, and I, wanna, I wanna make sure there's something tangible that you can take away with. So if you're gonna expand internationally, focus, focus on those four countries. They're not that big. Canada is like another state. Australia is like another state, really, right? New Zealand is a speck. <laughs> uh, UK is, is, is the one that's material, right? Because there's like 80 million in population. Um, but get, you, get your feet wet with those four countries and focus on cracking those four countries. What I mean by cracking is your logistics has to be on point, right? Your, um, your packaging has to be on point because Canada is gonna force you to um, print French on all, of your, on, on all of your packaging, right? And it's a pain in the butt, right? Um, so I, I would say focus on those four countries and then start testing in those other countries without internationalizing. So that's exactly what we did. So we, we created a site that, that um, advertised um, to German people in English because the, the amount of work that you have to go through to internationalize a site, all of your marketing collateral, that is, that's, that's a lot of work. Um, but now also explore things like chat GPT. There's so many AI tools that allows you to do that very quickly and that's gonna be commoditized very soon. Um, but test, test those countries first, starting with English speaking and then, and then go to uh, the non-English speaking countries. Right, I think you know, in terms of testing, there's obviously trends that happen in industries and I think you know, what's interesting, especially in high growth industries and with high growth businesses, um, trends are particularly important to get out ahead of, right? And I think you mentioned the inventory issue earlier. There's, there's real hiccups that can happen and real detriments to a business that can happen if you're not paying attention to trends. What trends are you seeing in kind of digital commerce more broadly, your space specifically, we can pick either of the above, and then how do you guys think about that? How does it guide the way you manage and grow and run the business? Trends is, 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 really, an, is a really interesting word. And, and you know, I remember years ago when we were just starting out, you're just focused on putting out fires every single day. Like, you don't give a shit about trends because you gotta, you gotta go put out the next fire, right? So you don't, ha you don't have time to actually look at the trends and see where, 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 where they're going. Um, but it is, it is a re it's really important. Um, we're seeing trend, a trend that consumers are going back, going back to retail. We're seeing that um, men are, for our industry, men are caring more about their hygiene, their, the way that they look, the way that they feel. And you know, I, I can't speak to the, the, you know, what your, your business is in, in, in the audience, but I, I think you do have to be sensitive on the trends and where it's going because you wanna get ahead of that. Um, you know, and I think that in, in terms of marketing, um, it's, it's gotten a little more complex. Right? It's, it's um, you know, you think about five, 10 years ago, influencer marketing wasn't really a thing, podcast, uh, programmatic, right, um, OTT. There's, there are a lot of ways to reach your customers right now and you really can't count on Facebook and, uh, and, and Amazon sponsored listings alone. Because right? you'll tap out, you'll get to a certain point 
and if all you're doing is Amazon sponsored listings, you're gonna get to a point where like, I wanna grow some more, and, uh, and, and I, you know, I'm bidding on all the keywords and I, I, I can't grow anymore. And then you're, then you're thinking, well, what, what, am I, what am I gonna do? I need to build out a D2C channel, I need to build out a retail channel, I need to talk to influencers. Um, but getting early on, on, getting in early on all of those marketing channels and, and spending the time and effort to test it, um, I, I think is, is, is really important. Uh, and of course, you know, the consumer expects more. They expect faster shipping, they expect better customer service, they expect higher quality products. Um, so those are all the things that you should, you, should, you should consider. And it's hard for me to go into like, you know, these are really broad examples and I, I, I apologize, for that, but it's really hard to go into a specific, I love diving deep and, uh, and it's, it's hard to dive deep when you're answering general questions. Yeah, for sure, for sure. But I think general concepts are helpful for folks. You know, it's, it's basic challenges, certainly nuanced answers to those challenges and nuanced pivots to what the business strategies would be um, are important there. In terms of testing and in terms of pivoting the strategy, what, what you know, given the conference we're at, what, what part does data play in that? And how data-centric is your decision making? Um, probably as you're creating a category or part of an industry, not a lot of data out there. How do you guys think about that? And how do you, you know, be as data-driven as you can, but also there's a fair bit of learning and, and things on the fly. How do you guys think about that mix? Look, data is extremely crucial. If you don't know how to read data, you have to learn how to read data. Data is everything. Um, when, you're, when you're small, you're, you're looking at, right, you're, you're looking at bidding, right? How much, how much is it costing you to bid? Um, this, this goes from Amazon sponsored listings all the way to Facebook and, and Google, right? You, you gotta learn um, how to how to read that data, how to iterate your ads. Um, and, but I'm sure like, everyone in this room kn knows that. But as you get bigger, now you're talking about much more massive amounts of data that you have to shift, that, that shift through. And that's, that now includes like, um, you know, NPS scores. Um, and, and you don't really, you, you probably, it becomes more important when you get to about 50 to 70 million in revenue where NPS scores gets really important, uh, and, and you're looking at you know, brand awareness in your category, um, that's where that kind of data really, um, really, you really need that data to drive the business to the next level. Right? Under 50 million, you're, you're really just focusing on right, building the right products, iterating, and, and, and getting, to, getting to the 50 million mark. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. I think, you know, as your business grows, the ripple effect of bad decisions or decisions that are not data oriented become pretty obvious and painful to, to mitigate. And so I think that that's something that, you know, we've heard a lot through folks at this conference and a lot through just our day to day is that as you get bigger, as the velocity picks up, as you're making bigger bets, you better be more data oriented and better be using as much of a fact base as you can to make those Absolutely. decisions. So it makes a ton of sense. As you were going through and, you know, and this is I'm sure is a progression as you've gone through the growth kind of spectrum you've gone through, Talk about building your e-commerce strategy, some of the struggles maybe you've had, and maybe what would, advice would you give to folks in the room who are experiencing higher than expected growth? Because I think growth's a great thing, but it comes with significant challenges at times. You know, and the inventory example used earlier was definitely one, but there are several, you know, channel optimization, channel mix, those things mm -hmm. all kind of come into play. How would, you, how would you give advice to this group in terms of how you think about that strategy, the development of it? The answer to, to these challenges is, build the right team. I mean, that's the de facto answer. There is no, there is no better answer than that. Uh, if you build the right team, they will help you solve any challenge that you, that you overcome. I'll give you a good, I'll give you a good and funny, um, just anecdote on, on when, when, what not to do when, when building a right team. So we, long time ago, we were just starting out and uh, we had this guy on the team um, and um, he, all he had to do was place orders with, with our manufacturer. And um, just really just placing orders. And we thought, that's so simple. How, how, can you, how can you mess that up? And one day, I get a phone call from our warehouse and said, hey, we just got a huge box of resistors and motors. And uh, I'm like, what? And, and, and Bun, he's like, what, what, what do you mean? Why are we getting a huge box of resistors? Somehow, this person had place orders for parts and not the whole thing. <laughs> so our manufacturer sent us parts. What, I, I just couldn't believe it. Um, 
What ended up happening? We got everyone in the company in the warehouse sitting there soldering and putting all these parts together. We created our own assembly line just so we can get product out the door. This is very early days. Um, so that's a great story on um, making sure that you have the right team. So that's, that's, the, first, that's the first I would, I would say is, is focus on the team. And then focus on what truly matters. Right? What's, what is going to take you to the next level? As entrepreneurs and as business owners here, I can tell you guys from experience that the worst thing that you do is put out fires every single day. And you gotta get to a point where you stop doing that. Right? And, and I, I'm, I'm, I don't know the makeup of the audience, but I'm sure everyone puts out a lot of fires every single day. And your business will, will not be able to scale if you are putting out fires every single day. And I'm sure you guys have heard this also from, from many other people. Um, but you gotta, you gotta get out of that role and you gotta bring in the right people to fill those shoes as you step out of that role. And then the last piece of, of, of this I would say is always have enough cash. <laughs> um, I, I know it's, it's easier to say um, than, than actually implement, but making sure that one of, one of your roles as a founder, as a business owner, as a CEO, is to make sure that you have enough liquidity to weather the bad times and to fund the good, the, the, the good times. So those are my three tips. Yeah, on that note, that, that's actually interesting. Because of the incredible growth curve, it's easy to get focused on top line and grow the business. When and how did you start thinking about optimization and kind of under the line metrics on the P&L versus the growth metric? And how'd you balance those things, you know? Oh, for us, it was, it was from day one. Okay. <laughs> we, uh, we, were, we did not want to be that Silicon Valley startup where we're burning a ton of cash um, and, and have the potential of going out of business. Going out of business, because a lot of those Silicon Valley startups, you know, it sounds great, um, but they go out, they go out of business all the time. We didn't want to be that. We didn't want to be that company. So we scaled, you know, from three to three hundred profitably, um, and and so we were always very sensitive on making sure that you know these sales are profitable. We're growing with uh, we've grown responsibly. That that, would, that I would encourage everyone to do that here because. It, um, it's great to scale, but it sucks to, to scale and then go out of business. <laughs> you take that one away from this. That's, that's <laughs> definitely one learning. Um, so I think we talked a lot about challenges, um, you know, and what comes with growth, and you've built an amazing business. What do you think you've just crushed it at? What have you done well? You know, what are the kind of the high points of your experiences in, the, in this journey? I think we've, we've, we've done really well telling our story and, and for, for the guys or the, the, the women that are in the audience that actually know our brand, um, you know, we're, we, we've surpassed, I mean, our brand awareness, the 18 to 35 is 79%, and in a very short amount of time, you know, and our, and our competitors are 100 year old brands, right? Um, and I, I think we've done really well in, in, in telling our story and making sure that men feel heard and they can relate to our brand. Um, I think we've done really well with um, building a phenomenal team that allows us to take on all these challenges. Um, and, and I think we've done really well with an omni-channel strategy. Very similar themes to things that I'm, that I'm talking about here, but it's like, it's not rocket science, right? We're, we're not trying to put a man on Mars. We're, we're trying to sell products. And it comes down, it distills down to these few key things that if you get right, uh, you, you, you become successful. Got it. I, I think as an interesting anecdote, you know, uh, someone in the audience actually was talking about prior life working with Norelco, and I think the comment was, we had more Manscaped meetings than you probably had <laughs> Manscaped meetings because it was such a disruptive force and the amount of momentum you were carrying, um, which should be a credit to you and the team. I, obviously, you did what you set out to do, and, and the growth is a result of that, so congratulations. That's, well, a, thank you. that's an amazing uh, comment to get. Um, you know, maybe pivoting to Amazon a little more specifically, um, and as you're building out that strategy and that experience, um, it's a lot different. You've mentioned some of the ways in terms of how you tell a story, some of the ways you would merchandise product. There's, there's differences in the way you, you would attack those channels. Um, any key strategies, tricks of the trade, things you might think are helpful to others in the audience or things you'd think people should think through or, or consider as they're building out their experience and going through that journey? Yeah, I, as, as I think through this question, um, I still go back to 
how do I, how do I answer this question with a framework that you guys can walk away from and, and, and utilize? And what I would, what I would say is um, be sensitive to what's, what's, being, what's, what's being used and consumed out there in the marketplace. And I'll, I'll, I'll expand on that. If, if, for example, we were very early on with TikTok, right? And we were, we, were, we were working with TikTok when they only had insertion orders. And it was like, you wire them $100,000 and they run your, like they didn't even have a platform at that time. And the reason I'm saying this, it's, it's really important to be sensitive of how, how marketing messages are, are, are marketing messages and your competitors are, 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 are utilizing um, these marketing channels. Because it's all about reaching your targeted customer and telling them your story. That's, that's really what it comes down to. If you're selling supplements, you're reaching your target audience and you're telling, why you're, you're telling them why your supplements are better. And that's, that's really what it comes down to as, as, as you're talking about marketing. So what I would say here is the difference between an Amazon experience and, a, and the D2C experience is if you're, if you're on Amazon, always try to mimic um, the D2C experience. You, you won't be able to because Amazon gives you a template, right? You can't really edit that. You, you can't really own that experience, but you have to maintain that, ex try to maintain that experience as much as possible. Videos, great photography, and test through all of your marketing message. Like for us, we, we the, the term um, right tools for the job really resonates with our consumers, with our, with our men, because guys love tools, right? We love hammers, we love you know, saws, and that's, that's, that's how we react to things. And so I would encourage you to think about what, what that distinct sentence is that really resonates to your consumers to, to sell your product. Um, and the only way you're gonna be able to do that is to test, test a few ads off, off platform, off Amazon, and, and to really refine that message. And then really think about, are, are, are our ads working well for this channel? Because I can tell you, like, TikTok, you don't wanna, you, you cannot use highly produced content. It will just fail drastically. Whereas on TV and programmatic TV, you can't use kind of UGC uh, TikTok content. So really understanding your marketing channels uh, is, is crucial to building that, building and scaling that brand. Because like I said, you will get to a point where you will saturate everything that you can do on Amazon, and then you will get to a point where you saturate everything you can do with Facebook and Google and so on, and you will want to scale further. Um, that's how you scale quickly, is by understanding what you're going to say to your, your customers and how to get to them. Awesome. Awesome. And I think that leads really well into, you know, a, a big theme of this conference is how do you take time and slow down? You're seeing incredible growth, business is chaos, everything seems to be a critical priority. How do you take time to slow down, focus on what matters, be really strategic about the business versus just to your point earlier, putting out fires every day? And how do you think about that and kind of create that culture? I say the easy answer to that is, is focus. So what does that mean when you say, when you say focus? Because every, everyone tells entrepreneurs to focus all the time. What the hell does that mean? In, in practice, what you want to do is every single year, right, you get with your management team, you sit down, what are the three things we absolutely have to achieve this year? And those are your three main pillars that you absolutely have to, 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 you have to achieve. And if it doesn't fall under whatever you're doing every single day, because one of the big things with entrepreneurs, and I suffer through this too, is like, what the hell do I do when I wake up in the morning? And your tendency is when you wake up in the morning is I, I'm gonna go put out fires, right? There's, there's this thing that I had to do on my, on my to-do list, it's that thing. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, like, all the entrepreneurs that I meet, I'm trying to push them and say, you gotta think bigger, you gotta plan longer. Don't plan in the next you know, month or quarter, plan in the next year, three years and five years. And it's hard to, it's hard to do that planning, it's hard to get there. Um, the, e, the, the, the baby step to get there is focus on those three things. Like what do I absolutely have to achieve? And it's like three or four things this year. And everything that you do has to ladder up to those three things. Because you can't do everything. And if you want your, 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 your business to scale, if you just focus on those three to four things every single year, I guarantee you, it, it will scale. Yeah. 
And it feels like your key principle of get the right team in place, hire the right people allows you to do that, right? You can't do everything. So having the right team, making sure confident in execution, decision making at every level in the organization facilitates that and some of that ability. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so last question, then maybe we'll open up for a couple of minutes if you're okay with it for some q &A. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's kind of the standard end of the thing. If there's one thing you could leave the group with, what is it? Like how, how would you send a message to this group that they walk, take away from this time employee in their in their day to day and in, in their struggles to grow businesses and manage businesses day to day? So I think the generic answer everyone hears is, you know, persevere, work hard, you know, do things you're passionate about. I think all that's great, but I kind of think it's, it's it's not really tangible. It's you hear that everywhere. It's a little bit of BS. I would say um, test, 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 right? You might think that you have the best idea out there, and then you test it and you realize it's shit. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's, it's the truth, right? So it's always test, test, test. Test marketing campaigns, test packaging, test, you know, everything you, you do, test it. And when you, see a, when you see a winner, lean into it. And that's, it's a formula. Like being successful and, and scaling a business, it comes down to, it's really a formula. And, um, and that's one of the biggest things is in that formula is test, test, test. The next one I would say is pivot quickly. If a test is not working out, like just cut it. A lot of people hang on and they don't, they, they don't, they don't cut it. Um, and the last one is of course, have enough cash. Because <laughs> going out of business is a real thing. <laughs> I heard it sucks to go out of business. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. Uh, somebody told me that. <laughs> um, if you're good with it, maybe we'll open up questions for Paul. Uh, looks like we got one in, up here. Sorry, McKenna, I'm gonna pick the furthest possible one from where you were just to make you. Uh, yeah. Thanks for running. Um, my question is, you talked about a lot about finding the right people. What do you look for in the people that you hire? Like, what, what do you look for in the first couple of people you hire, and what do you look for now? Culture, culture fit. That's the, that's the biggest thing. They have to believe in your vision. You have to be, especially your early employees, early people that you associate and you put around you, cannot be toxic. Like you cannot have cancer in the organization, especially when you're, when you're small, right? Um, the cancer just, it, it, will, it will spread. So I would, I would always look for culture fit. Like who, who has a similar work ethic, right? Who has, and I would even deprioritize experience over culture fit, right? Especially early on, right? When you get to a couple hundred employees, you know, a couple thousand employees, now you're looking for specialty. But very early on, if you're, you know, under 50, it is, it is culture, it is making sure that the team works cohesively together, everyone enjoys working at the company. Like we, it's still today, culture fit is incredibly important to, for us. We win awards for having the best workplace all the time. And that's because it's one of the top three things, right, that we focus on beyond consumer experience is the health of our organization. Um, so, uh, yeah, simple answer is make sure that you hire for culture. So you were talking about um, getting into some of the smaller English-speaking countries, just kind of getting your feet wet, wet in the international markets. Um, do you think that strategically is that better than, say, trying to get into the U.S. Uh, Spanish market? I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. That's interesting. The U.S. Spanish market, um, I would say it's, it depends on your product. Right? It's, it's a difficult answer. It's a difficult question to answer broadly. But depending on your product, um, the U.S. Sp Spanish-speaking market is um, lower on, on the economic you know, income scale. So whether you're, if you're selling a premium, luxury, high-priced item, it, it might not resonate as well. Right, but if you're selling something that, that matches that demographic, um, that, might, that might be worthwhile. Because then you can start spreading, expanding into you know, Mexico and the other Spanish-speaking countries. Um, but for us, it, it's, we sell a high-priced premium product, so it's not, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a fit for us. But that's not to say it's not a fit for your, for your business. So once again, it's test, test, test. You know, run a couple spots on Telemundo. Right? See, see, how, see how that performs. And it goes back to tracking and, and, and data. You've mentioned um, 
the importance of storytelling and testing. And so with those two in mind, um, I'd love to hear a story about uh, testing that your team has done that have impacted where the brand is now or the growth of the brand. Oh, absolutely. Testing, um, to get our brand here, we run a, 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 a ton of testing. The easiest testing is like Facebook makes it so easy now. You can spend two, three hundred dollars and test so many different marketing messages. And what you're reading through is you're reading through click through rates, right? To find that term right tools for the job, right, was um, was through an, a, a huge iterative matrix of here are all of the things that we run on our ads, right? And this how how do they perform? Like who clicks on on this the most? Right? What term do they, they use? And so the process behind that is you get, you get your team into a room and you hypothesize, like throw a lot of different st statements, right? value propositions. You should buy R, X because of Y. Right? And throw that all down and then, and then put it in a, into a Facebook campaign and see which one gets the most, um, gets the most clicks. And then from there, you iterate through those. Right? And that's, that's how you start really refining and fine tuning. This is, this is how I get to that singular statement, that, um, that value proposition that makes it very clear for my customers that this is why they should buy my product. Cool, looks like we have time for one more and then we'll. Um, what new habit belief or, yeah, habit or belief in the last few years have you picked up that's most impacted your life in a positive way? My wife is in the audience, so I'm gonna say listen to her. <laughs> but <laughs> There's the safe answer. Yeah. Um, habit, sleeping more. I, I, I'm, as I'm sure all of you here, you know, as, as you're building your business, uh, it's all consuming. Right? You, 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 you eat it, you sleep it, you, know, you, you wake up to it, and, um, and you get less sensitive to, to your body and your mental state of mind. So to answer, to answer your question, um, make sure you get enough sleep. That's, that's, the, that's the habit I picked up in, in, in the last two years. Because um, it, it, it allows you to be sharper, um, and it, it just, you know, you, you think better. Um, don't overwork yourself. Because that's, that's not always efficient. Awesome. Well, Paul, thank you very much for being here today. I think this was a great session. Congratulations on the massive success.